Good evening. I want to welcome you to our Monday edition, if I can put it that way, of Treasures of Truth. Uh, I hope that you were able to be with us yesterday uh, as uh, our dear uh, brother, uh, Dr. Jay LaRue, uh, brought the word of the Lord. And uh, we were just really blessed to have uh, Jared Cooper back with us uh, to lead us in worship. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult time right now with a lot of things that are going on, but it's in, in some ways it's a, it's a wonderful time uh, because, you know, it, it, th these difficult times have caused us to have to rise up in some situations. And, you know, just this videotaping and so on, we've never really done that before. We've considered having a... <clears throat> live streaming, you know, someday with our church and so on, but never really got around to it. And it's, it's caused us to have to advance things a little quicker, uh, using the technology to get uh, uh, guest ministry that are friends of ours, that are anointed and really gifted to be part of the oversight of the Lighthouse, to be able to speak, you know, from different locations, Pastor Phil in Washington, Dr. J in, in Florida, and then also uh, raising up uh, our, some of the, the folks within our church, uh, we're going to be blessed on Wednesday night, uh, this Wednesday night in the Treasures of Truth, uh, because uh, one of my sons in the faith, uh, uh, dear brother uh, Desmond Davis, is going to be sharing the word on Wednesday night. So those of you that are listening, uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, Desmond's going to bring the word for us. And I've got some others that I want to be uh, integrating into uh, what we're doing here in this in-between time. Uh, before we can actually or before we're able to come together once again in the house of the Lord and worship together and, and praise the Lord together and fellowship together. So um, uh, I'm excited about that and I'm very thankful for men and women of God uh, who are gifted, called, anointed and uh, uh, willing to use those gifts in many different ways. I mean, even the technical side of things here. Um, uh, that's not something that I, I just was not raised with it with that understanding and we've got young people here that are that are working at things uh, as far as being able to put out a good a good audio good video uh, I, I, I'll use the word production but I don't want to use it uh, as if it's uh, you know we're, we're, we're uh, setting up scenes and all that kind of a thing uh, but a, 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 a place to bring the word of the Lord from a a, uh, a place to advance God's word through the opportunities and the resources we have today, especially with, so, with social media. Anyhow, this, more, uh, this evening, I'm sorry, this evening I want to share uh, a, a, on a topic that is kind of like, where did that come from out of the blue? Um, but it's to answer a question. I've had a couple people ask me a question because of some things that are going on right now, and you'll, you'll understand it when I, I think when I uh, share about it. And uh, it's, an, it's a topic I don't talk about all that much. And yet it's something that is, I think, very important. It is very important to the church, not only from the standpoint of the, 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 the corporate body church, but individuals that, of course, make up the body of Christ to be able to live in and walk in the provision and the blessing of the Lord uh, to its fullest. And especially in this day that, uh, you know, people are, are, are jobs and uh, bills and all those things, it's not, they're, they're not quite as prevalent, you know, as they have been. Uh, and it would be a time to really look and say, you know, I need to really reel some things in here. Not that we don't, not that it, this isn't a, a time to be austere and a time to be dis really disciplined in our spending and so on. But this is a time that we need God's provision. You know, the provision of man and the provision that takes place in, in the country that we're living in today and globally uh, isn't flowing as, as much, uh, quite as freely as we're used to having it. And so, you know, what are we going to do about these things? Well, some people would say you need to hoard uh, but God says that you need to give. He says, give, and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will men give into your bosom. So the question that I've been asked uh, the last few weeks is, do we have the, of course, this is income tax time, and, uh, or income tax return time, tax return time, getting the taxes in by April 15th, uh, which I think probably that's been uh, adjusted a little bit. And then, of course, if you get a return, getting your, your taxes back, your tax return. And then with the stimulus check, and also with the unemployment. Some people are receiving unemployment, and uh, I'd read about and heard, but some people have said to me, uh, gee, Pastor, the unemployment I'm getting, you know, uh, along with uh, the extra that they're giving is more money than I make in a week when I'm working. And then, as I said a minute ago, the stimulus. I had a number of people ask me about the stimulus uh, when they get that. And so the question that I've been asked is, is are those things 
are those things that we should be tithing on? Do we need to tithe on them uh, as far as what does God expect? <clears throat> and I find that when it comes to tithing, and I, I've got a, a manual that I have put together of 10 lessons on, I call it divine ownership. It's on stewardship, what it means to be a steward. I go over that every few years, and one of the sessions in it I, that I address is the uh, issue of tithing. But what I really start out with is the whole issue of stewardship. But I want to read, uh, first of all, from Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. I think I, I, think I quoted this verse uh, when I closed uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, on Friday night when I was sharing from uh, the ministry of Elijah. Anyhow, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, it says, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, and evangelists, it says, and, and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so that, what we, what we refer to here in our circles as five-fold ministry, uh, are, 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 are like the instructors, the coaches, the teachers, the trainers, uh, uh, the equippers uh, of the church, so that the church can do the work of ministry. For many years, I think uh, it was expected that if you were a pastor, uh, that you were to do the work of ministry, and the church was supposed to just come and listen to you do your thing. Uh, but there's been an understanding and a revelation from the Word that's come in the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years, 50 years, whatever, that uh, that ministry is to equip and train and instruct and guide and prepare the church so that the church can do the work of ministry. A lot of people get bored. They're like, man, I've been going to a church for 30 years and, and there's really nothing new happening. Well, it might be because you're not doing anything. Now, it might not be because you don't want to, but because the opportunity isn't there because everything's centered around one or two people in the church. Where this teaches that the uh, five-fold ministry is for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. What is the ministry? Well, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 5 says that there's a wide variety of ministries within the church. So ministry isn't just preaching. Ministry isn't just teaching. Ministry isn't just counseling. Ministry isn't just being on a worship team. But part of our ministry is the ministry of the tithe. And that's what I'm calling this uh, teaching uh, tonight is the ministry of the tithe. And so to understand the ministry of the tithe, we first need to understand. And once again, I, I could probably to do a good job of this, I would probably need two one-hour sessions to really lay it in, the, 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 the word and the doctrine, the way I'd prefer to do it. I'm having to step it up and quicken it up a little bit for our sake to answer the question for the people who would ask. And so the first thing we really need to do is understand basic, a basic understanding of stewardship. What is stewardship in the first place? Well, stewardship is that we are uh, all we are and all that we possess belongs to the Lord. We need to know that as believers, all that we are, me, the person, okay, my body, soul, spirit, all that we are and all that we possess, that we say, well, that's mine, that's my car, that's my house, those are my things. All of those things, they belong to the Lord. And you might say, well, gee, they got my name on them, you know, that, that, that bank account's got my name on it and so on and so forth. It's, it's not the point of whose name is on it. The point is, according to Scripture, biblically, when you came to Christ, uh, when you accepted and received his blood payment for your sins, you received forgiveness, you received a kingdom inheritance, you received a new identity, you received the gift of eternal life. Man, that's some pretty amazing stuff you and I received when we became born again. Uh, that, stuff has, that, that stuff is invaluable. You can't put a monetary value on eternal life. But when we took the gifts, the gift of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of our inheritance in the saints, the gift of forgiveness. They were given to us because we, I didn't do anything for them. Jesus paid for them. He paid the price so the, those things could be restored back to me when he died on the cross. And that's why when he died, he said, it's paid in full. It's finished. To tell us die. Paid in full. He didn't pay for his sins. He didn't have any. He paid for mine. He paid for the sins of the world. And so what happened is, is God gave us, because Jesus paid our, our debt, God gave us the blessing, the inheritance, the name, everything that he had blessed his son Jesus with, God gave that to us, and then, what? so where, where was I in this? Jesus gives his life, God gives all the blessings to us, does it cost me anything? Well, yes, it cost me my life, in that my life no longer is my own. My life now 
who I am, what I am, body, soul, spirit, and all my possessions, my relationships, my family, my children, all of that goes to the Lord. And so he receives me. And so the Bible goes on to say here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and here's the important, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that scripture, there's many other scriptures, but that scripture makes it very clear that there was a transaction that took place when I became born again. And when I became born again was really my signing the bottom line of the transaction that took place on the cross. The transaction took place on the cross. Jesus paid the price for the sins of humanity on the cross, but for you to gain the benefit of that, you've got to sign the bottom line and enter into that contract or that covenant with God through Jesus Christ yourself. And when you do that, it's called being born again. And at that time, these resources now, legally, these resources of God's inheritance and God's kingdom and eternal life, they become yours. It's not something you're going to possess someday. They're yours now. But you need to understand that in that transaction, there's something I have to do, and it's that I recognize that my life now becomes the Lord's. I don't belong to myself anymore. I'm not my own, it said here. I'm bought with a price, it says. I'm to glorify God in my spirit and body, which are the Lord's. As a matter of fact, when Jesus died on the cross, the, the, the propitiation, uh, that's what it's called, uh, the, the word ransom is used in some versions of the Bible. He paid a ransom for us. The, a ransom is the money or price paid for the redemption of a prisoner or slave. It's the price paid. He paid a price, okay? A price had to be paid for our sins to be dealt with and, and, and for, for God to be appeased uh, to, concerning the sins of humanity. He paid a steep price. And so now I was bought with a price. You, you, you're not going to go someplace, Wegmans or Walmart or wherever you go. You're not going to go to a store or go to an automobile uh, uh, place uh, uh, and, 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 and pay a price for something and, and not take it home with you. You're not going to go you know, to Wegmans and just give them $500 and they say, well, gee, do you want $500 worth of groceries? No, 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 I don't need that. No, when we pay a price, we expect to get something in return. Well, the price was paid for us and what we're agreeing upon is my life now belongs to the Lord. The great thing about that is I'm a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I didn't have to die. Jesus died for me. That's a wonderful thing, so I can live. But in my life, I'm dying daily because I'm dying to myself because I've given my life to the Lord. This is a very important thing to understand if we're going to understand the significance of and practice the ministry of the tithe. Therefore, we have become stewards or managers of another's, that's God's, property and affairs. We have then become his stewards, okay? I, I've been brought, and that's what the Bible uses the term slave sometimes, and people don't like that because of the connotations of slavery in the natural, and I understand that wholeheartedly. But the idea of it is, is that God now owns me, okay? And I tell you what, my life has been a heck of a lot better since God took up ownership than when I owned my own life. And so, uh, the, the ownership that has taken place causes me now, God now has made me a, a steward or a manager of his affairs, a manager of his resources and a manager of his possessions. So he doesn't just come in and like raid the cupboard and take away your, takes everything away from you. He takes away your th thinking. He takes away your, your, your vision. He takes away your purpose in life. He takes away your stuff. He takes it all away. No, God doesn't do that. He says, okay, now those things are all mine, but your role in this whole thing now is to be a manager of those things. It's to be a steward of those things. Uh, you need to understand they belong to me, the Lord says. All of it is mine, but I'm honoring you and letting you keep them and manage them according to my purposes and my will. And as you do that, you're going to find yourself blessed. You're going to find yourself with increase. You're going to find all of your needs met exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we can ask or think. And then the third aspect under stewardship is that the first responsibility of a steward, according to 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, is that he or she be faithful says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 
Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And so my first priority as a manager or steward of what God owns, which is me and everything that I owned at one time and had my name on it, it's all God's now. And so as a steward, my first responsibility isn't to try to figure out how to use it, figure out how I can do this, figure out how I can do that. It's to be faithful to God. It's to be faithful to the owner. I need to be faithful to him. I need to be faithful to seeking his will. I need to be faithful to hearing his voice. I need to be faithful to understanding his ways. So when it comes to managing his affairs and managing his property, that looks like my stuff. You know, people come along and say, oh, that's a great house you got. Oh, that's a great thing you got. But I know that they belong to the Lord. I'm just managing them for the Lord. That I'm managing that I manage them according to his will, not according to my will. So that's understanding stewardship in a nutshell. The next thing is, is understanding the tithe principle, okay? What is this thing called the tithe? People talk about tithes, they talk about offerings, they talk about giving, they talk about different things. And once again, I don't have time uh, t- tonight to get into the whole offering thing. I just want to talk about this thing called the tithe, okay? Uh, and, and the principle in a nutshell, in general, is this. I, want, I wrote this, I want to read this to you. Is that God allows us to keep and distribute 90% of what he owns, 90% of what he owns and he has entrusted into my hands, he has given for me to keep it and to distribute it, and then he requires to use 10% for the supply of his house. He requires of me to take 10%, tithe, the word tithe means tenth, a tenth part of a whole. He says, he, he, he lets me take 90% of it and, and, and use it, and uh, again, I, I should pray, seek his face. How's God? He doesn't want me using it for you know, evil or using it for m- means that are contrary to his will and way and purpose. But he says that uh, here, you go and manage these things. You read my word. You love me. You serve me. You worship me. I'll teach you. I'll instruct you. You go use it uh, as you see fit. You know, if you want to go bl- buy the blue car instead of the red truck or whatever, go for it. Go ahead and do it. But he requires of us that 10% of what we have, we give back to him by giving it to his house. It would kind of be like somebody saying, you know, a lot of times when, when there's a funeral or something, people will want to give, uh, you know, they'll, they'll want to send flowers or money, and there'll be a, 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 in the obituary, let's say, send any of your gifts uh, to such and such a place in memory of so-and-so. All right. So what God is saying is, listen, you don't need to send me the 10%. You don't need to give me the 10%, me meaning God. He says, what I want you to do is to take that 10% and I want you to put it in my house, the church. Okay. I want you to put it in my storehouse, he calls it. I want you to put it in the place where uh, there is uh, ministry, where there is teaching, where there's instruction, in a place where there is uh, receiving of funds sometimes and distributing of funds, whether they be to pay for electric bills or, 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 or maintenance on a building or to go to people who are struggling with needs in their life, whatever. He says, I want my, my, my house is to be a storehouse. A storehouse is a place where you put things and you save them or set them aside and then you use them. It's like your cupboard at home. You're just putting stuff in, taking stuff out. Before you go to the store, you look at the cupboard and you say, okay, what do we need, honey? Well, we, we, we're out of salt and we're out of this. God wants us to take that tithe, that tenth part, and put it into the storehouse. No questions asked. That's not my responsibility for where it goes or what it does. I'm supposed to come and put it in God's name, in memory of God, in God's storehouse is really what it says. Now, let me read this verse to you. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. It says, God, I'm sorry, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me because you say, in what way have we robbed you? I mean, who wants to be accused of robbing God? I can't think of anybody who finds themselves robbing God that can expect God to bless them, that can expect God to come, oh, I'm glad you're here today. I just want to give you all kinds of stuff. If you have robbed him, okay? So he's using, this is God saying that. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what have we robbed you? His response is, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house. And try me now in this, 
says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. That sounds like great stuff for me. That sounds like good news. But I'll tell you, the, the day we're living in, we're going to find that we need God's hand and God's provision in our life. And some people will say, well, you know, why would God require me to do something so that I can get something? Isn't God loving enough to just give it to me? Well, the Bible says that God is a wise, he's a wise owner. You don't just go around throwing money around or throwing resources around if somebody's going to waste them. The Bible also tells us that uh, God requires us, he, it's called the principle of sowing and reaping. God says, it's, it's up to you to sow. As a man sows, so shall he reap. The farmer can't go out and look at his field and, and, and cross his arms and say, okay, God, I'm going to pray now in Jesus' name that you cause corn to grow out in my field. No, but God says, I've given you seed. You go out and you plow the field. You go out and you prepare the field. You go out and sow the seed. I'll bring the sun, I'll bring the rain, and you'll end up with a crop that's so much more than what you sowed into the ground. And so that's a principle with God. It's called sowing and reaping. If we're not faithful as stewards, why would we expect Him to bless us? Remember the stewards uh, in, the, in the parable of the talents. One was given five, he turned them into ten. One was given two, he turned them into four. One took it and went and dug a hole and put it in the ground, and he got rebuked because he didn't even make an invent. He didn't do anything to cause what he was given to have increase in it. And so God says, you want to be uh, th 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 those people in the, t in the talents. It says they went and served. They went and worked. They went and, and made uh, five, uh, 10 out of 5. And so there was a labor. There was a work involved. Uh, God wants to, us to... Uh, he's not asking me to do a whole lot. He's not asking me to do too much. But I need to set my heart to seek His face. I need to be obedient to Him. And when He says, uh, you're robbing me if you keep the tithe, you know... I need to then look and repent immediately and get my tithe into his storehouse. And God has made it very clear that the storehouse is his house, is his household, is his church. And so uh, the, uh, the, we are to tithe. Okay, so what do I, a tenth of what? We are to tithe. Here's what tenth means. It's a tenth of your increase. Anything that causes the value of what you have to increase is something that I am called to tithe upon. We are to tithe on any increase that we receive. Increase is a rise in the amount, number, or value of something. Anytime you get a rise in the amount, uh, number, or value of something that you possess, remember, it's God's in the first place. Well, at that point in time, God requires us to tithe, to pay, take a tenth of that value, of that increase, and to give it to the Lord's house to the storehouse in his name. I'm giving it to the Lord, but I'm giving it to his house because he's, it's his house. Let me read Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 to you. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. You see, the tithe is a way that we honor God. Keep in mind, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God doesn't need my dollar, my, my hundred dollars, my thousand dollars, or if I had a million dollars or a billion dollars. God doesn't need those things. The fact of the matter is, it's, it's a test for me to live by faith because it's first that a steward be found faithful. Well, how is my faith tested? Well, my faith was tested the other day because, you know, I was driving down the road and there was an accident in front of me and I just swerved in the right time and I really believe God helped me be out there. Amen. Praise God. Absolutely. But weekly, regularly, every time I get an increase in my, with my paycheck, that's a test of my being faithful to God. Days that the sun's shining, days that it's raining. Days when I got a lot of money, days when I don't have any. Days when the transmission went out of my car, days when somebody gave me a new car. doesn't matter what it is. It's whenever you have an increase in your possessions, I am called to tithe on that, to give a tenth part of it to the storehouse. And with the first fruits of all of your increase, then he says this in verse 10, so your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. How many of you think having a full barn is a good thing? How many of you think of having a vat overflowing? How many of you think in having your needs met exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask or think is a good thing? Well then, God has said, you want that? Then pay your tithe, the first fruits of your increase. 
What do we tithe on? Well, I just said the first fruits of my, of, of my increase. Uh, my paycheck. I'm to tithe on my paycheck, okay? Um, if I get a raise, I'm to tithe on that raise. If I get an annual bonus, I'm to tithe on that bonus. If I get a commission, I've got a base pay, but I get a commission. I'm to tithe on the base pay. I'm to tithe uh, on the commission. I'm to tithe on my tax return if, if you're tithing on your gross income before taxes are taken out, then you don't need to tithe on your income tax return because you already have. But if you're tithing on your net, if you're tithing on the actual money that comes to you in your paycheck, $453.22, but that's after taxes are taken out, then when you get your income tax return back, you need to tithe on your income tax return. You need to tithe on your stimulus check. Oh, how come? Why? Because it's an increase. Is it an increase to you? Absolutely it is. God has given you an increase of $1,200 or $2,400 or whatever it is. It's to be tithed upon. If you get unemployment, okay, well, I certainly shouldn't tithe on my unemployment check. Why not? Your unemployment is an increase to you. It's an increase in the way it's going today. It sounds like some people are getting a pretty good increase out of that. Whether it was a lot or a little, you're still to tithe on it because it is an increase. If you get an inheritance, uh, you know, somebody leaves you uh, $20,000 or $100,000 or whatever, it's an increase. You're to tithe on that increase. I know some people are like, are you kidding me? This is crazy. This is ridiculous. Well, I'll tell you what, Penny and I started tithing the week we got saved. Um, and I had a hard time with it a little bit, to be honest with you, because I, I'm, I'm very much about money management, and we were very much, uh, uh, didn't have a whole lot back at that time. But it was just a conviction that God put in my heart like he did some other things that nobody had told me about either. And we've been tithing ever since that time. We also give offerings. But again, that's a kind of another, that's, a, that's, that's another thing. I'll, I'll comment on that in a minute. But that's, a, that's another thing, the tithe and the offering. Uh, but we have, didn't have a whole lot. But over the years, God has blessed us. God's blessed us in ways that I, I couldn't have ever seen them coming to where we have a beautiful home. We have uh, beautiful friends, relationships. Um, uh, it's not that we haven't had trials and tribulations and conflicts and struggle within our family, but we're in touch with our children, all of our children, every one of them, every day. And uh, uh, it's it just, God has blessed us. We are a blessed couple. We are a blessed family. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our increase, we've been given vehicles and then we turned around and took the vehicle we had and gave it to somebody else. This to me is... It, it, it just, it works, but it's so in me now that it's not something that I think about. Uh, can I afford to tithe? I can't afford not to tithe. Um, you know, there's questions about what if I, oh, if I have debt, uh, you know, certainly I need to pay the debt off before I tithe. Absolutely not. The reason why you're in debt is a good chance because you haven't been tithing. And so remember, God gets the first fruits. And I want to just read a few things here as I finish about what tithing isn't and what tithing is. Uh, First of all, tithing isn't putting money in the offering box, okay? It's not putting money. Uh, some churches pass a plate. We have a box. Read about that back in the Old Testament. I can't remember exactly where it was, but we have a box. We don't have a time in our service necessarily that we set aside for the offering like I've been in churches before. Okay, we're going to receive our offer. We're going to take our offering right now. and They pass the plates or whatever. Uh, we encourage people at the beginning of praise and worship time, but there's, money, there's, there's tithes that have already gone in there before we even started the service. There's tithes that go in there afterwards. But we have a box, but putting a gift in the box is not tithing, okay? It can be. That's where we put our tithes. But some people think that if they put you know, any amount in a box that they just gave their tithe. No, your tithe is a tenth of your or 10% of your increase. The first fruits, not after taxes, not after the electric bill is paid, whatever. The first fruit, that's tithing. Anything else is giving, okay? And, it, you know, it's a good thing to be a giver. But tithing is another thing. Tithing is putting 10% of your increase in the offering box on a regular basis basis. It's not a one-time thing. It's something we do on a regular basis. When I get the increase, I tithe on it. I calculate it out. I don't calculate it out to the dime or the nickel. I just roll it up to the next dollar or the next five dollars or the next ten dollars, whatever, when it comes to how I, we give. Uh, second thing, tithing isn't putting a portion of your money in the offering box after all of your other bills are paid. 
okay? This isn't what's left over goes to God. Those would be the last fruits, okay? God said that we're to give the first fruits of our increase. So the first fruits of our increase is right off the top. You've heard that said. Well, then take it off the top. Off the top means whatever's in there, I do my 10% based on everything, take the 10% off the top, the other 90% is left for me to manage according to what I believe would be the will of God for my life and my family and my resources. Tithing is the first 10% of your gross income. So keep in mind, the paycheck that you get, unless you're a, a business owner, uh, possibly, uh, even if you're a business owner, you probably don't, the check you get is the net, okay? The taxes are already taken out. You're to tithe on the gross, not on the net. Otherwise, the government gets the first fruits. That's not the way God said it. He gets the first fruits. Some folks will say, well, you know, that all sounds good, but that tithing thing is in the Old Testament. Uh, we're, we're living under the New Testament today. You don't know how many people I've had tell me that. And uh, so therefore, because we're under the New Covenant, Jesus said that he uh, came to deal with the law, and he dealt with that matter, and so the law is, 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 is done with. And so under the New Testament, it's kind of what I want to give, what I feel like giving, uh, but we're not required to give the tithe anymore. Uh, that doesn't work either, because when you look in the Scriptures... Tithing isn't part of the Old Testament law. Jesus didn't say, I came to fulfill the Old Testament. Jesus didn't say, I came to do away with the Old Testament. He says, I came to fulfill the law. Uh, therefore, being fulfilled or done away with on the cross. Tithing is a pre-law principle. It's affirmed in the New Testament by Jesus himself. So tithing was way before Moses came along in the law. Tithing, we see, took place way back in Abraham, when, when Abram tithed to Melchizedek. I want to read this section of Scripture. This is back in Genesis 14. 18 through 20. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. Uh, you'll find when you read about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, uh, and you start looking into who was this Melchizedek guy, uh, well, I'm just going to let you go search it out for yourself, but I believe God will show you some pretty awesome and amazing things. Anyhow, and it said, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who was delivered? Who has delivered your enemies into your hand? And he gave him a tithe of all. And so um, Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of everything that he had. And uh, so we see that it was a pre-law thing. Uh, we we don't go back and you know say, well, I don't need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength anymore because that was in the old covenant. Well, no, of course we know we need to do that, and so on. Then Jesus himself, though, also affirmed the tithe in Matthew 23, 23. It says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees and hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the most important aspect of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Then he says this, this is important. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So he wasn't coming along saying, okay, just be kind to everybody, just love everybody and so on, and that will take care of what I need you to do. I don't need you tithing anymore. No, he said, you need to tithe. Tithing is still a significant aspect because it's where my faith is tested. It's the first level of my faith test in my life is my giving of the tithe that I'm trusting in the Lord. But he says, don't neglect, though, that you also need to be loving people, you need to be merciful, you need to be faithful and so on. Uh, just getting ready to finish up here. Tithing isn't giving to a ministry. TV, radio, crisis pregnancy, missions, that's not tithing, okay? Some people say, well, I tithe to uh, a television ministry. If that's not your local church where you go to, participate, sit in the seats and you're part of, that's not the storehouse for you, okay? If your storehouse is a television ministry, then you need to repent of that to start out with, and you need to get planted in the local house of the Lord so you can flourish in the courts of your God. There's nothing wrong with receiving messages from places if, as long as they're consistent with the Word of God, but you need to know what the purpose is of your local house so that you can be involved in ministry, so you can be involved in the practice of what that church is doing in your community. And so, uh, does that mean I can't give then to a television ministry or whatever? Absolutely not. You certainly can. But that would be an offering, not your tithe. You should never give your tithe to the radio, to television, uh, to a, a, a missionary even, 
Uh, missionary is not the local storehouse. We support missionaries here, and uh, we support missionaries a lot, and our church is awesome when it comes to supporting missionaries for the size of our church, but our people never give their tithe to the missions offering. We've got the tithe, and we've got the missions offering. We've got special offerings that we receive for. We just received one for a pastor and their ministry in Kenya uh, a couple of weeks ago where the locusts have come in and the coronavirus has hit. And uh, I said, church, you know, whatever we give them, if it's five, ten dollars, whatever. And our church just came and gave money. Uh, we were able to give a large sum of money to them. But you know what? When we uh, when, when when the treasurer uh, took a look at the tithe and 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 you saw what the tithe was coming in, didn't skip a beat, didn't lack anything from what the tithe was on any other given week. So we need to understand that that's not given, giving to a ministry, even though we should give to ministries. That's where the offering comes in, and I don't really have time to speak about that right now. Tithing is giving to your local church that you attend and that provides for your personal spiritual growth. Last of all, next to the last, true tithing will teach you the fear of the Lord. You know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We don't hear a lot of teaching today about the fear of the Lord. We don't hear pastors talking about the fear of the Lord because people don't like that. They don't even like that phrase. Well, why would I be afraid of God? It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not being afraid of God. It's having a respect for God. It's, we read the verse in Proverbs, honor the Lord with your possessions and your first fruits. I have the fear of the Lord. My life is in the hands of the Lord. When a coronavirus comes or something worse or whatever, I'm trusting in God. I'm, 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 I'm sanitizing my hands. I wear my mask when I go out. I'm being obedient to the, print, the guidelines that have been given to us by our government up to this point. But at the same time, I'm not trusting in the government. I'm not trusting in the scientists. And I'm not trusting in the doctors. I'm trusting in the Lord. And uh, I put my trust in him because I'm faithful to God. Uh, oh, you're sinless, Pastor Roger? No, I'm not sinless. I make mistakes. I do things wrong. Selfishness creeps in and rules the day sometimes in my life and pride. But I'm just saying that uh, I have a fear of the Lord. And so f for me to consider keeping my tithe and spending it on a vacation or to make a payment on something or whatever, I'll tell you what, for me, it does, it's not even a thought in my mind. If I need finances, I'll go to somebody. I'll, I'll take out a loan if I have to, but I will not rob God. Because if you rob God, who are you going to be trusting in in the, days, uh, in the day here and in the days ahead? So um, let me read this verse, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 23. It says, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. Here we go. That you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. That you may learn to fear, honor, respect the Lord your God always. And then it will bring it into this. Tithing is a regular, consistent test of your faithfulness to God. You don't need to talk about how faithful. Oh, I'm faithful to God. I love my kids. I'm faithful to God. I'm there for my neighbors. I'm faithful to God. I pray every day. I'm faithful to God. That's all good stuff. Okay, Those are areas that we need to be faithful to God. But I'm telling you right now, your first place of faithfulness is in your tithe. If you're not tithing, then those other things are inhibited by your lack of trusting and honoring God with the tithe. Just telling you that's the way it is at this point. In time. I don't count the money here. I don't know who gives and who doesn't give. And so I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. Like I said, our church as a whole is awesome. I'm thinking about you, whether you're in the lighthouse, whether you are used to be, whether you're out there someplace and in another church or wherever it is. I'm thinking about you uh, being blessed, protected, watched over by the provision of the Lord himself and for you to qualify for that, for you to qualify for that, you need to not only be born again, but you need to be a tither. I'm not saying that if you don't tithe, God will never bless you. He, he, he does. That's just who God is. But I'm saying the tithe is something that is a regular test of my faith whenever there is an increase in my life especially financially and so on and so forth. And then it's also a test of faithfulness, uh, of God's faithfulness to you, but it's also a test of your faithfulness, 
of, of, of uh, God's faithfulness to you because he says this. I'm going to close with this scripture. And I read it earlier in Malachi. He says, test me, try me. He used the word try. Try or test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. This is a, the tithe is something that God says is a test. He says it's a test for you to see if you're going to trust me and be faithful. He says, but you're also testing me to see if I'm going to do what I said I would do for you. I said that if you will tithe and not rob me with your tithes and offerings, I said that I'm going to pour out a blessing on you that so big you're going to not even be able to receive it. I'll tell you what, I like a challenge like that. I said, okay, we're going to go for it. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to see if God does his part. I'm telling you right now, our testimony as a family is God has done exceedingly abundantly above and beyond I could ever ask or think when it comes to honoring his part of the tithe by blessing our family, our church, and our ministry. And so I, I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm answering this question for uh, three or four people who ask it of me. I might be answering it for 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 or 200 people. Um, look in the scriptures. This is what the Bible teaches concerning the tithe and why it is so significant and important in the day that we live. Always has been, but in the day that we live in. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you love us so much. We are your children. You said that as many as received you, you gave power to become the children of God. Many times in the Word you talk about what a father would do for his children, and you are that father and we are your children. You desire to bless us, to protect us, to guard us and guide us and keep us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. We have been given gifts. Great gifts have been given to us. Eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, multiple, as Corinthians says, various gifts and ministries that have been deposited, imparted, and bestowed in us and upon us. You've kept your part of the bargain, Lord. Now, Lord God, my prayer is that part, again, I talked about the Elijah generation the other day, I believe is also going to be a generation that does not rob God. Lord, I don't want to ever be accused of robbing you by keeping back something that doesn't even belong to me in the first place. I thank God for the 90% that you've given to me to manage according to your word and ways. But Lord, I want to be faithful with the 10% of my increase and do so in the tithe. And I pray that this would be a word that you would use to speak, Lord God, to the hearts of the hearers, Lord God, because I believe that you want to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon people that are even listening to this message. Lord, that it's going to become even not only a resource for them, but a resource that you're going to use them as, a, as givers, uh, as, as resources for others. And so, Lord I, Lord, I thank you, I praise you, and I thank you for your word, because your word is truth. And I ask these things tonight, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, I just want to, uh, again, a quick reminder, Desmond Davis is going to be sharing uh, Treasures of Truth on Wednesday night at 7 p.m., and uh, you need to get a hold of me. Again, I, uh, it, it was great that uh, the question was asked about the tithe right here on the board, pastorrogerlcf at gmail.com. You can uh, email me anytime with questions, suggestions, uh, uh, thoughts, comments, whatever it might be, and uh, I'm really, uh, really thankful and grateful for those of you that, uh, whether it's tonight or uh, multiple other times, have come to join us for these treasures of truth. I hope they'll become a treasure chest for you in your life. In Jesus' name.